We were actually talking about this. Okay. <laughs> Hi guys, Jasmine here. Um, I'm back. I haven't been making videos in a long while, and uh, the content of this video is a little bit as to why. I mean, I've also just been super busy with life, and at some point I'll have to make an update on life, but today... <laughs> okay. I'm sorry for this, like, ridiculous introduction, but I can't believe I'm actually talking about this. Um, it's hard to talk about, and uh, but today I've had such a tough day with this particular issue that I just, I have to talk about it um, because I know that so many people are struggling with this and it helps me to know that other people are struggling with it and that I'm not the only one facing this. And so, um, as usual, I overshare about my life on the internet. Um, but <laughs> we're talking today about medical PTSD and that took me a whole minute to say. Great start, Jasmine. Okay, uh, medical PTSD has been kicking my ass it's been so bad. Like, okay, this is actually the hardest thing I've ever had to do. And like, if you've paid any attention to any of my previous stuff, you know that like, my life has not been simple. Um, <laughs> I mean, okay, if this is the hardest thing I've had to do health-wise, that says a lot. Um, that statement alone says a lot. I have had two awake brain surgeries. I have Parkinson's. I've had for almost a decade and I'm gonna be 24 soon. Um, I've had a feeding tube for three years. Um, yeah, my life has not been easy or simple in any way. Um, and I've always prided myself on being a survivor. Um, every medical challenge I have risen up to and met, um, and I've freaking conquered. And I'm proud of that. I really am. Which I think is why medical PTSD was that many times harder, is because I felt like I should be able to do it. And when I couldn't, it was really crippling. So, before I talk any more about my own struggle, what is medical PTSD? <laughs> um, I feel like before you talk about anything, you should define it. Well, PTSD is the difference between, let's first talk about the difference between trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder. So trauma, obviously something bad happens to you. Okay, trauma. PTSD, and, and trauma can be hard and like really difficult to deal with and not be PTSD. Um, what makes PTSD post-traumatic stress disorder is that you actually have a dissociative state to it, like the, the flashback point. So it's kind of like whenever that trauma is brought up again, it's like your mind can't stay in the present. Your mind goes all the way back and it's almost like you're physically there. Um, I mean, I know that I don't have complete dissociation with my PTSD, like I, I have kind of a partial dissociation. Um, I'm at least kind of able to stay slightly in the moment for the most part. I mean, there have been times where that's been like not true, but for the most part, I still like in my head sort of know I'm where I am. I can come back to it. I can be like, okay, I'm here. I'm not there. I'm here. I'm here. Um, sometimes that's not true, which I guess really sinks, but my head is totally back to October of 2016, where something really horrible happened to me in the hospital. Um, and I've had a lot of horrible things happening to the hospital. Like, if you had to ask me where my medical stress started, I'd say almost 10 years ago at the beginning of 2009 when my symptoms started. Because from day one, like, life in the hospital was really difficult. Um, nobody had answers for me. Um, and I was misdiagnosed for four years. And those were hard four years. Like, those misdiagnoses years, at some point, I won't have to talk about those in detail, but they sucked. I mean, it was, it was bad. Like I was constantly not believed, like while my body was falling apart, I was scared. I was a kid. I, it took away my childhood. Um, and it, it, it was really difficult, but like what really started the, 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 the really dramatic stuff was when my symptoms flared, um, halfway through college and I started to need medical attention. Um, in the hospital for more than just ER trips. Um, <laughs> okay, um, and I have talked about some of these points um, in past videos, like I've talked about different points, but I haven't really talked about the one trauma that was the most significant. I wrote a blog about it recently. Um, but when you have medical PTSD, the, the first, the, the, the that incident, it's, I, I was trying to explain it to my sister the other day, 
And I was saying, it's like, imagine the worst thing you've ever experienced in your entire life. Okay, like your worst, most painful experience. And imagine that every time something that you associate with that experience comes up, you go right back to that moment. And you're it's like you're in it again. And you relive it over and over and over again. Um, stupid Kaiser in their kiosks. Okay, I had a doctor's appointment. And this was just a regular run-of-the-mill. I have to see my general doctor every six months. Um, because one of my medications requires you to see a doctor. To see your doctor in person every six months by federal law. So I went in to see my doctor a couple weeks ago. And I was checking on, on the kiosks. And there's something called the topaz. Um, like a, like It's like an electronic signature thing. And every time you have a surgery or some sort of procedure, you have to sign this this topaz thing. And it's like it it's like signing a piece of paper. And so when I put in my credit card for my copayment and I looked down to sign, it was a topaz scanner. Like the exact same ones that they use in the procedure rooms at the hospital. And like just that scanner, like having to sign that scanner was so hard. It was like signing for this procedure and then you have to go wait in this waiting room and it's just, it was like signing my name was stupidly hard. And for somebody who had prided themselves for so long on like being totally fine with some really difficult things, like having a difficult time signing your name is so overwhelming and it feels embarrassing and it just feels like st you feel stupid like you feel like i shouldn't i shouldn't have this struggle like i shouldn't find this so freaking hard like i should be able to go have a doctor's appointment without like having a panic attack in the waiting room um for an appointment i know in my head is gonna be nothing like it's just gonna be me talking to the doctor you know, them checking my vitals, saying like, okay, we're all good, we can continue. Like, it was a nothing appointment. Like, I didn't even need a flu shot. Like, it was, it was, it was nothing. And I knew that, and yet signing the signature made me feel like I was in the interventional radiology bay about to have a procedure. Um, because, and th there's a couple of different, uh, different traumas that were significant, but the one that... <sighs> The one that hurts the most was October 2016. <laughs> it was election night, which um, was a bad day for a different reason. But after that, um, something was wrong. I had I had gotten my, my surgical jejunostomy tube put in um, about three weeks before this. Um, and it was my second feeding tube, and it was a much more difficult procedure. And we did it. And this, 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 this feed, two feeding tube has been amazing once it healed. But until it healed, it was hell on earth. It was like six months of just horrible, horrible problems. Like it was problem after problem. Like I was in the, for like the first two months I was in the hospital just back and forth and back and forth. Um, my entire digestive tract shut down from it. Like it was, it was, it was really bad. It was a really bad experience. But about three weeks after, like I had this pain at my tube site and I was like, something's wrong. And so I told my dad, I said, you know what? Like, I don't know what's wrong, but something is like, we need to go in. And what happened was um, at about 2 a.m., my tube started coming out. Like, it literally started sliding out of my body. And I literally called it and then yelled, Somebody call, somebody call surgery! Like, my feeding tube is sliding out of my body. Yeah, that was fun. Because um, the balloon, there's like an internal balloon that holds it in and it burst. Um, which was literally, it was just a defective tube. Like, it happens. They're most, like, 99% of the tubes are totally fine. There's a defective one every bunch or so. And I got it. Yay. Yeah, so yeah, so it burst in my body, which was super fun. I like I the good, the good thing was I joked that it was like I thought my soul was just exiting my body and quitting on humanity, but no, it was just a feeding tube. Um <laughs> gotta have humor in the midst of all this craziness, but and that's sort of one of my coping mechanisms. Like I laugh about things that really shouldn't be funny sometimes, um, with my own health and yeah, anyways, you learn things about that about yourself like that in treatment for all this, but yeah. Um, anyways, um, back to back to that night, November of 2016. Um, 
so IR finally came in around like 10 o'clock the next day. Oh, by the way, their their answer to to the problem of my tube sliding on my body was to literally sew it to my abdomen. That was fun. Um, yeah, so they, you know, so then IR was going to come and replace it. So I was taken back to the IR bay around like 10 in the morning and there was some hold up back there and they didn't actually get to replacing my tube until way later. And at this point, I was out of cinnamon. And if you know anything about Parkinson's drugs, you know that being out of your Parkinson's medication means like serious motor symptoms. Now, Parkinson's symptoms tend to flare with trauma. And here I was having like a three week old, very, very sensitive feeding tube tract being replaced. And it's not a comfortable procedure. Like, they have to pull this thing out and like shove a new one in. Like it's really, it's really, it's really difficult. It's painful. And that's why they sort of partially knock you out for it and give you pain medication during it. But like, I'm not somebody who knocks out for like anything. Okay. It really takes me like deep sedation to actually sleep, like twilight sedation my body just kind of laps at. But um, yeah, so I was not asleep. Um, and I kept telling them, like I kept trying to tell them that like I needed Cinemet. I felt like I couldn't breathe because my chest muscles were getting so tight. And every time they were moving anything with my tube, like my, my legs were just cramping and spasming. Like my muscles were just freaking out. Like I was having these rolling spasms down my back. And like my muscles were just in so much pain and they were just they were just locking so tight because I was out of my medication and I kept trying to tell them that I need my medication and the nurses just kept trying to tell me to stop um, and they kept yelling at me to stop screaming um, and to stay still when I literally couldn't help it um, and I kept screaming to stop for them to stop and the doctor just completely disregarded me acted like I wasn't even conscious and replaced my tube well all that was happening which was about 10 minutes of hell um i don't cry about things um with pain it takes a lot for me to be uncomfortable um and i can handle a lot but I've, i i have there's I, I can't remember another time except for waking up from brain surgery i woke up from brain surgery screaming but they had literally just cut open my head. That was the only other time. W waking up from brain surgery, still kind of in that druggy haze, I'm just like crying so hard that I couldn't even think about anything else but just like in this estate. Like that's the only other time that I can remember feeling that way. And this was just a feeding tube change. Uh huh. It shouldn't have been that way. And the stupid thing about it, the thing that makes me the most angry about it is that if the doctor had just stopped for five fucking minutes and said, hey, okay, like, let's, let's just all calm down together. Like, what do you need? And I would have literally been able to be like, I need my cinnamon. And they could have gotten it for me. And we would have been fine. <laughs> if he had talked and said, hey, like, you know, we're okay. Even if they couldn't have gotten it for me, we could have gotten through this. It could have been like, okay, we're going to get through this together. Like, you know, like, just take a breath. We're just going to pause. It wouldn't have taken him any more than five minutes out of his day. And this procedure, there was nothing like so like rush extreme about this procedure that it needed to be done like immediately. Like, okay, if you're having a heart attack and like you're freaking out, like they should they should treat that first, you know? That's okay. Like, you know, if it's gonna kill you, yeah, they should probably do whatever they have to do to save your life before they worry about your feelings. But if your life is not immediately in danger, like taking five minutes to acknowledge a patient's feelings can literally save them from hours of therapy and just hours of pain and, and like years of suffering that are so unnecessary. Like literally five minutes of this guy's could have guy's life could have could have made the past year of mine so much better. Past almost two years of mine. <sighs> yeah. Five minutes. That's it. But after that, um I mean, things were hard before that, but after that, I can't even go into a hospital without a like, major struggle, like, the smells. Um, also, I'm one of, like, 15% of Heal Park, unless you still have the smell. Like, the one thing that not having would be kind of helpful. I still got, thanks, universe. Um, 
Like, I shouldn't complain about not having a symptom, but, like, I have all the other ones. <laughs> One of the less inconvenient ones would have been nice. Um, but, oh, man. <laughs> that was really hard to talk about. Um, it was hard to talk about and stay here at the same time. But I'm working on it because I'm so tired of it. I'm so tired of it, like being this constant fight. So tired of going to the doctor and just being stressed because of the environment. I'm tired of, and halfway through simple procedures, having like, being in like a complete panic. I had my Marina replaced recently. Marina IUD, it's a pretty simple procedure. It takes about 10 minutes to replace. But halfway through, I literally had to ask her to stop and just be like, because I was not there anymore and I was at like this horrible spot. I just needed to re recenter and, and re, re I was able to get through it, but it was so difficult. And I was like, this should not have been this hard. <sighs> okay, well, so I have not been to the dentist in five years. Yeah. That's because, <laughs> I think it was 19 the last time I went. That, that yeah, that, that's because well, for a while, there was a lot of health things going on. Like, I had brain surgery. <laughs> you know, that kind of took precedent over literally everything else. Um, but it's not the, the, the thing about it is that after I got better from that, then the medical trauma was just really strong, and I, I just couldn't do it. And that's something that I think has been conflated in my mind. Like, I am so afraid to do that. Um, and I've been working on my, with my therapist. I've been working with therapist now for like eight or nine months um, to try to just, you know, to try to face this. And he's helping me. He's really helping me like work through all of it and to like, you know, to face this head on. Um, because, you know, you need to go after five years. Um, I don't think I have any big problems, but I don't want to have a problem because I didn't go either. Um, and my dentist is somebody we've known since I was like literally four years old. Like his daughter and I were best friends in elementary school, like you know. But um, God, um, but for some reason that is one doctor's experience that has just been like really associated with all this. I'm not really sure why, but it's one that I am seriously afraid of, and I've been working for quite a few months now to to be able to handle. Um, I'm going to do that next week. Um, today I drove past the office, <laughs> like intentionally, um, and then proceeded to, to calm down. I walked through Target for like an hour and bought food for my family and listened to the same song on repeat. Yeah. Um, which was weirdly helpful. But <sighs> I'm going to go next week. Um, and the good thing is, we've talked about it, if I can handle 10 minutes, I can handle 10 minutes. If I need medication, I need medication. Um, but having somebody who's going to partner with you and be on your side for that is extremely helpful, and I'm very lucky to have. But... If you have medical PTSD, I'm sorry. This is so hard. Like, this is the hardest thing I've ever had to do. Um, and I think that the stigma part of it is almost the hardest part. Um, mental illness shouldn't be so signified because quite frankly, it's, it's just like physical illnesses. It's something you can't control. Except when you have a physical illness, people can say be strong. And you're like, yeah, when you have a mental illness, You don't feel strong. But even though just just admitting that it's going on and that and trying to get help for it, that is strong. Um, because that's taken so much more strength than anything I've faced in the past. Um, and yet I'm not being strong based on the definition I think a lot of people have. A lot of people think that I think have this, this this idea that going into health stuff without fear 
is is strong. I don't think that's really true. I think getting through something really freaking difficult, however you get through it, is strong. Um, and I want I want to be strong through this. I think that in this case, strength is admitting that it's hard and is doing everything I can to get better because I want to have a future where maybe I work in a hospital. And so I need to be able to enter a hospital without it being traumatic. <laughs> That'd be nice, right? Um, yeah. And I need to be able to, to just have these normal hospital experiences. Because here's the thing, um, with all this health stuff, like, for me, I'm somebody who has to go to the doctors really frequently and who, like, really relies on hospitals. And then it's kind of like, I rely on hospitals, but I can't even go into one without freaking out. Not super ideal, but anyone needs to be able to go to to go into a hospital. Like everybody has medical procedures they're gonna need for the rest of their lives. Like it's, it's medic medicine is something we need. You know, you should get a physical from your doctor every so often, um, and be able to do that without having signing your name. having signing your name be the hardest thing you did all week. Really nice. Um, and this, 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 this has just been crippling. Like it has the past year or so, well, I have done a lot. It's, it's taken over my life and I'm so ready to be done with it. But I know I have a lot more struggling with it left to do. Um, and I kind of want to sort of vlog those struggles as they happen because the only thing that makes this okay in any way is that I'm not alone. And I really hate that my friends are going through this. And so often, gosh, so often my friend's health stuff is super triggery for me too. Because some of it's just way too familiar. Um, a good friend of mine posted this video after a procedure like this where a doctor didn't didn't respect her stopping. <sighs> yeah, that was really hard to watch. But at the same time, I'm sure this was hard to watch for some people who were watching. I'm sure it was. Because it's a trigger, right? It's like those things that remind you of of these experiences but that is my medical PTSD and I feel like when I get through this there's nothing in the world that could stop me for that and I feel like when I get through this hopefully I can make something really beautiful out of the ashes Learning to let go is so hard. Learning to forgive is so hard. But all we can do is be better. All we can do is exemplify the human kindness that was taken from us. That empathy, that caring for your fellow human that the doctor who did my procedure lacked. All I can do is try to carry that forward and give that to every person I meet, because it takes five minutes of your day to not fuck someone up for the rest of their lives. It's worth your five minutes. So, if you're where I am, you're not alone. If you love somebody who's where I am, please, please be patient with them. Be gentle. Approach them with a kind heart. <sighs> because it's what is so needed. Because this is not something you can explain. Like I've tried <laughs> I've tried to explain this to my family. I'm trying to explain this right now. And I don't even think I've really conveyed the feeling. Just the pure awfulness that is being on the inside of this. Like, it is 
<laughs> well, the worst I would say, you know, it, it, it's like being where the worst part, of the worst, the worst moment of your life over and over again. Like, but the thing about that is that every moment that you have it, every time you go back there, the time you went back to the time that was the worst becomes a part of the worst. It just, it just exponentially grows. And so, just be patient and kind, always. Because, and be patient with yourselves that you have this. Like, I have been, the, the more unpatient I am with myself, the harder I push myself to be okay, the less okay I am. The more I treat myself with kindness and empathy and respect, the better things get. But... Sometimes I'm really bad at that. And so if you are, <laughs> well, that's a good skill to learn. And let me know because I'm still not that great. I'm still very much learning it. <sighs> and it's really difficult, but caring and loving yourself is the first step. Admitting that this is a problem. Admitting that it's above your own control and that struggling is so hard but it's it's what begins this path and oh maybe maybe in a couple months I'll be making some sort of an update to this video and say you know things got better I hope they do for now well I'm just gonna try to conquer what I can so that's medical PTSD in 26 minutes I hope you learned something from this and I'll keep sharing as time goes on because I think it's important to show what recovery looks like. Recovery is also not a linear path. Recovery is up and downs and lows and highs and twists and bends and recovery is a total mess. But as long as you're moving in that direction, there's no defining what your recovery is. So you're struggling, wondering why yours isn't looking right, it probably is. It just doesn't seem that because there's no easy way out. There is no magic pill for medical PTSD. There is only hard work. There is only pain. There is only struggle. I can't say it now because I'm not even close to the finish line of this, but I hope someday that the world is a little bit easier, and I believe it will be. I just haven't seen it yet. Until next time. <laughs>